That's the goal. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate that you came. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alfred. Uh, you're welcome. If you guys don't mind me, just see. Um, so we're ready to go. And uh, we have a double feature. We have two Australians for them back to back. So uh, here's Dave Wilson. <coughs> Uh, so I've come here to talk about uh, Mars activities in Australia, um, of which you've just seen one, and, uh, uh, and I'll, I've got quite a few slides, so I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. So at the moment, uh, the question is, does Australia have a space program? And, and the answer is it, it doesn't. But there is, just in 2009, a, uh, an Australian space policy unit, which has been formed within the Department of Industry, Innovation, NASA Research, or, uh, Science Research and Tertiary Education uh, Organisation. And uh, they're organising a national space industry policy. And they have been uh, giving out grants. And the grants that they give out for are just satellite communications, earth observation, navigation and education. And we've applied for a lot of, uh, uh, we've put in a lot of proposals but because they've very, been very selective, um, we've never managed to win any, even though we've been teamed up with uh, 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 CSIRO and some universities. The Department of Defence is, is purchasing spy satellites from, or a spy satellite from the USA, and uh, <coughs> some unis teach aerospace and uh, uh, planetary science. And then finally, the real work is done down here by us and uh, National Space Society. Uh, we're very good friends with them. And, uh, and the Planetary Society, which uh, actually I, I don't think they're all that active. So that's, that just about sums it up. Um, and I've shown this slide because this is what I've been doing before I came here. But the reason is, is Australia is very focused on primary industry, particularly mining. And uh, they're very good at that. It's automated, it's high tech. Um, but for some reason or other, they don't seem to want to make that leap to, to go beyond that. But uh, so from people who are interested in Mars, very much their perspective is influenced by the mining industry, geology, and all those sort of things. Um, the reason why I put this photo in here is because <coughs> on Friday there was a lot of discussion of how to bury a Mars base. And uh, all sorts of ideas have been put forward, and, and in particular, uh, going into skylights and things like that. <coughs> um, uh, I, I think a two-ton bulldozer is more than satisfactory, and, and uh, small bulldozers could make this quite easily. You don't need this machine to do that. So, our, one of our main activities is um, NASA Space was Bound, which is based in um, uh, at NASA Ames. And uh, uh, we've been sending teachers, quite a lot of teachers, to various NASA field trips, or NASA space bound field trips in um, the Mojave Desert and Namibia. And we've also done about uh, at least four field trips or five field trips ourselves, of which two uh, were NASA space bound. Uh, and we've been collaborating uh, with people here on that. Um, <clears throat> so this one is uh, to Akarula, which has an 800 million year old history. Um, uh, and this one had quite a few teachers. I think there were five or six Australian teachers. Uh, half the people were from the US, again, including teachers, and uh, uh, a number of uh, planetary scientists. These people are looking at desert varnish. These people are, are around radio radioactive uh, springs. We brought with us a great big, uh, a full lab. Uh, some people went flying, uh, wandering out the desert and um, interviewing with the press. Um, <clears throat> last year we did um, a field trip to the Pilbara where uh, we were looking at uh, 3.5 billion year old stromatolite fossils, which is in fact the oldest agreed fossils uh, um, that uh, people agree on that are fossils. And this is up in this region here, in that region in there. There's a number of sites. In particular, we went to the Dawn of Life Trail. And um, also at Shark Bay down here, there's some living fossils. So these rocks here are, are 
living stromatolites and in between a, a biomax. And if there was ever uh, life on Mars, say two billion years ago, it probably would have looked a bit like this. Uh, of course, there's the mining again, which is this region is full of. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things you look at is if you were on Mars with a spacesuit and you see something like that, uh, the question is, is it a fossil? And um, there's a list, list of uh, questions you can ask yourself if you, if you want to know if it's a fossil. Um, some, some are cone shape. This is, you're quite lucky to see this. Uh, you've got to make sure it's in the right kind of rock. On Mars, uh, um, it may well be in magnesium carbonate rather than calcium carbonate. You'll see layered triangles like this. Uh, some will have elevated spines, and really good ones will have a, a feature up, up the middle, uh, a sort of a, a line, which some people are qu not quite sure why that's the case. Of course, you all know this, don't you, being... Uh, uh, planetary scientists. We also visit a, a, a mine site, um, <coughs> where, uh, which was a mesa. So mesas are inverted dry rivers. Effectively, there was a river, and uh, it dried out. It became uh, hard, or hard material was deposited, and the land around it was eroded away, probably by wind or water. And what we left is is uh, an inverted river. So this is once the riverbed along the top here, and um, this is a one at Gale Crater. And in this particular mine site, they'd cut a slice right through a meter. <coughs> so uh, we went in and got samples uh, in there. And uh, also we got a core, uh, a core as well, or the output, uh, a spectrograph of a core. Uh, the other thing we did in the Pilbara last year was we did uh, some, we, we bought a spacesuit, a pressurizable spacesuit, and uh, um, the kind of things we were looking at is what do you see and what do you miss if you put out in the field to go and look for stromatolites, as you would when you're on Mars. Um, uh, what do you see and what we don't? And, uh, and also what technologies you might want to help you perform your task better and more efficiently. <coughs> And uh, basically, uh, you miss about 25% when, you, when you're wearing a spacesuit. At least this is what we found. We had uh, field geologists, uh, and also we had uh, science teachers doing this, and there was a difference between the two. Uh, interestingly enough, they all could characterise what they found quite well within the knowledge that they had. And uh, the other thing that came out, of course, everyone wanted to bend up and look really, really close. They brought their visor right up close to the rock. Um, which, which uh, uh, you can imagine, uh, others have, who have done this uh, don't agree with that, but the field scientists were, and uh, um, a lot of people were crawling around on the ground, which is quite difficult to do in a spacesuit. Um, we had some uh, um, onlookers. Uh, we had uh, the children of Nalagine, <coughs> who um, I don't really know what they thought of the Americans but they all seem to be running around in a spacesuit like that uh, with big boots and these children uh, had no trouble, these, these are very spiky, the spin effects, and, and the rocks down here, if you look how sharp they are, but they had no trouble running across that and uh, uh, we were all of course in big boots and, uh, and of course this policeman <coughs> and his family came um, and he just had to arrest the guy in the spacesuit. Um, and very typical, he travelled with his family four hours to come and see us. He heard about us. In particular, his wife was interested and in, in family, so he just got into his car and they just uh, travelled four hours, which is very typical in that area. Um, so another project uh, is Mars Oz, and um, that's it down there. Um, we, of course, we like to be different, and we, we decided to go a different route. So you've got a tuna can and a tuna can at Utah, but we wanted a, a tube or a bent biconic lying on its side. And really we just wanted to provide, try something different. There's, we don't see why everyone should be choosing these. And uh, <coughs> the other thing is, was we, we became very integrated in with the um, South Australian University, <coughs> and the idea was is that they, they would have an education program, an outreach program with schools, 
as well as their undergraduate students to to use this facility <coughs> and we would also have workshops and things like that in it. Um, unfortunately it costs money and it's very hard to find money for this sort of thing so it's a pending project. Uh, we've located it again at Arkarula, which we visited earlier with Space with Bound, and it's near a, a private wilderness lodge, <coughs> and uh, uh, which is very useful and they would help do maintenance on it. And this is the kind of region it is. Um, it's, uh, uh, it does have a lot of geological interest. interest. There's a lot of fossils, pre-Cambrian uh, explosion period. Snowball Earth is represented there, meteorite impacts, and um, Articaria fora. Uh, this is the one of the hot radioactive springs. It's about 70 degrees and it's radioactive. There is actually uranium mine not far away. Uh, so our Mars Oz is basically a, a, um, a bent biconic and uh, it's designed so that it can be hitched up to a truck and to tow down the road. So it's built in a factory rather than erected in the field. And I'll go through all the motions why we ended up with that. So we, have it, we had a design. Uh, we spent some time thinking about the design. And the issues we thought of were living areas upstairs, <coughs> away from noisy areas downstairs. The working areas would be downstairs. And uh, we, we set the rooms up so that we, we took into account noise, dust, and, uh, and yeah, but particularly dust working its way through the head. And that's why we put the living upstairs and the sleeping area not above the lab. Uh, the diameter is actually quite um, careful. This is 4.7 metres. Uh, most bridges are at least five metres high, so to get it under bridges or overpasses, it needed to be less than four metres, uh, less than five metres. And that kind of resulted in the room being a standard 2.1 metres, which is a standard industrial height. Uh, and that kind of set it up. The, the, the geometry fell out from that. And it fell out, fell out quite easily, actually. So, of course, uh, if that wasn't enough, we decided we'd do our own Australian mission architecture, um, uh, our own design reference mission, using this. And we kind of went down this path because we, we uh, just really wanted to know um, the possibility of, uh, of whether all this was quite possible and the issues uh, behind it all. <coughs> so uh, we use a, a HAB to take people. It's a, it's a Mars indirect uh, strategy, or semi-direct, I should say, approach, not Mars direct. We had a Mars transfer vehicle, which has got a space capsule, a bit perhaps like a dragon, and a HAB behind it. Uh, a supply module that gets thrown out when it comes back and rocket propulsion to um, fire it back to Earth when it comes back. Uh, and one, one of our HABs has a Mars Ascent vehicle which is a bit like a, a lunar, upper stage lunar lander on steroids. Um, <coughs> so you can see how the Mars transfer vehicle flies to Mars like that. When it gets it, it sheds its aero shield. Um, the uh, Mars Ascent vehicle can dock to that. We throw out all um, unnecessary items before we boost back to Earth, travel back to Earth, and then land on Earth and in a capsule. Uh, why did we choose a bent biconic? <coughs> and there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the main reason is it can land a large mass uh, uh, on the surface. Um, it's got a larger lift-drag ratio and a smaller ballistic co coefficient than than these um, uh, vehicles. Um, <coughs> the reason is, is you can use all the belly as a heat shield. And, uh, um, uh, and the result is, is you can stay in the atmosphere long enough to slow down. Uh, uh, you can stay in the atmosphere longer to slow down, which means you can carry more mass. Um, so we were looking at uh, a low Earth departure of, of around about 60 tonnes, landing about 40 tonnes 45 tonnes on Mars. Uh, the other thing we did, which is a bit of a diversion, we, we decided it was better to build your HAB not as a spaceship, but as a house. And all spaceship stuff, when it gets to Mars, gets tossed away, and you'll see that in a minute. So um, <coughs> the other thing is, by using uh, a horizontal tube, 
the, it can be, it's easy to, to um, put wheels on and tow around and take, take it to different locations where you can't do that with a, a, a tuna can hab so easily. So it, it, uh, tuna can habs land where they stand. So like this one, it stands where it lands, <coughs> whereas we can put wheels on and roll it away. Um, also we can fit, it's easier to unload stuff if you compare the two, and it's also you can have much longer structures, longer cargo. So it's actually a very good sort of way of building a large Mars base. Um, <coughs> the disadvantage of it is that um, it, uh, I don't think it's as mass efficient as a tuna can type structure. And when you, if you've got all your propellants in one location, the uh, C of G will move as you're coming in. So all that, it's a bit more complicated to, to when you do the final landing. So here's our, our kind of design at the end. And uh, we had an Earth return vehicle squeezed inside, um, <coughs> or a Mars ascent vehicle squeezed inside uh, one of the halves. And also we had a detachable garage that we could pull away. And I'm just, uh, we, we did compare it to one of the earlier design reference missions, and um, they've gone for, they've ended up with 60 tonnes, we've ended up with about the same. They're carrying six people, we're carrying four, so we're a bit more conservative than they are. And you can see the difference with the, the volumes. Um, so our plan was, we land a, a cargo vehicle and it unfurls a solar, uh, solar powered unit. Um, <coughs> by not choosing nuclear power, uh, it's, uh, it restricts the amount of propellant you can make on the surface which means you can, your, your Mars Ascent vehicle becomes very small and that's what drove why we had a Mars Ascent vehicle to go into orbit rather than all the way back to the Earth. Um, <coughs> of course we've got the Australian flag here, not the US one, that's fine. And you notice over here all the propellant tanks uh, are pulled away and kept well away and this might be a house for 80 years or 100 years or whatever. So rather than having a blow-up hab, which we felt had issues concerning with dust, although we don't disagree in not using that approach, we decided to unbolt the back and plug it in and then you can plug together more, more uh, uh, units and you can put them in culverts and bury them, which is much easier, again, than a tuna can type vehicle. So another project is Star Chaser, <coughs> uh, which um, has been, uh, although we have the money, we're using volunteer labour. This, uh, this is a rover. Uh, it's, it's, it's going at the pace of a constipated snail on crutches. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, um, they actually moved it to Tasmania, which is where I'm from, with the idea that it would like, quicken up, but I've come here instead. But there are people there doing it. Uh, and the idea is, is to... to um, <coughs> uh, uh, we, we're thinking of a crew of three um, or a crew of two. Uh, makes a big difference when you're carting supplies. It's a factor of it's a third extra whether you've got two people or two people or three people uh, uh, to, to go across the countryside. And uh, what safe exploration strategies would you use in terms of if it breaks down, what do you do? How far away can you travel, and so on. Um, so this is what we want to do. We think we can get it done within the next 12 months. Uh, another th uh, one, one of our people, uh, James Waldy, has been doing, uh, he did, did his PhD in mechanical counterpressure suits, <coughs> which I won't go into that because he uh, ended up working at MIT for a year and he's designed and built and tested a new penguin suit, which, which is a, re a more update version of the Russian penguin suit. And that applies, as a, uh, it applies a vertical load on the body to, to um, so, so in uh, zero G, <coughs> the body is subjected to a G force acting on it. And uh, um, at the moment, ESA, uh, ESA have taken it up and uh, they would like to test it on the space station. And at the moment, they have people uh, lying in beds wearing them and others not wearing them. I don't know how long for and what they're doing there, but um, <coughs> uh, they certainly enjoyed testing it 
in, uh, in the zero G in the aeroplane. Uh, one of the projects we did, we, we collaborated with uh, the CSIRO, which is a government science organisation, and <coughs> the plan was was to use the uh, was to um, extract water out of um, um, hydrated minerals, <coughs> um, particularly on Mars, there's a, a lot of magnesium hydrated man magnesium sulphate, and. Uh, um, uh, CSIRO were going to do the automation, so these would be teleoperated, or, or, or sorry, there would be autonomous uh, mining equipment, and uh, we would extract the um, the water uh, by crushing the the, uh, the rock and um, microwaving microwaving it to get the water out. Unfortunately, we didn't win any money on that, <coughs> um, although it did quite well in the and the final outcome. But we, we have a lot of friends in CSIRO that would like to see this project go. And also we had planned to team up with um, uh, guys at Houston uh, doing uh, ISIU work. Uh, and the aim at that time, which was some years ago, was that this would be a, a, a token towards the Constellation project. And we would extract water from um, the, the lunar soil. Um, finally, one of, the, one of the things we did was uh, a rocket engine, uh, which was a gas um, liquid rocket engine. Um, I won't go into that all that much, but we didn't blow ourselves up. The, 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 aim, the aim was to um, <coughs> uh, learn how to design and test these things. And uh, uh, Australia doesn't actually have anyone building um, liquid propellant rocket engines. so. I was told that this was the first one for a very long time. And uh, uh, when you fire up a rocket engine for the first time, it can go as planned, it can do nothing or it can explode. And uh, this was very much in our minds when we were running this. So we did have some firings and its performance was pretty pathetic, but uh, it did start up and shut down as it was supposed to. We did monitor everything. The reason why it didn't perform so well was uh, the mixture rich uh, wasn't, wasn't right. We weren't getting the right feed of uh, uh, oxygen into the into, at the time, but because of the um, uh, because of the valves were slowing it up too much. That came in as a gas, but it didn't matter. We we just wanted to practice it and see whether it worked, and then make a big, better one, which uh, uh, we haven't got round to yet. But we do have a we do have some on the drawing board. So uh, finally, we we've uh, there is uh, a, a quite a good book. book. Uh, written one by one of our people, um, <coughs> and we've also got a mascot rover which is meant to do maintenance, uh, uh, and it's using these um, hexapetal wheels that, that uh, uh, which actually won the grant to build it, and uh, that is working at the moment. Um, so the last slide is uh, our president. Um, died a few weeks ago and uh, he, he was quite instrumental in getting a lot of money um, out of people and uh, he'd formed strong links to the Australian Space Policy Unit uh, who is now a corporate member of us and uh, so they support us quite strongly although they don't give us anything in terms of money and uh, uh, also if you want to give money to the Mars Society of Australia you get a 125% tax deduction <coughs> as long as you're an Australian. Um, and uh, uh, also he, he was the prime mover for the Spaceward Bound program and he probably spent two to three days a week working for nothing on, on all this. So that's it, folks. So we can take a few questions. Oh, it's about 80. Yeah, and no, uh, they're in a, uh, they're in spread right across the country, everywhere. So, um, yeah, it, which is as, is as big as the U.S. So uh, we do most of us do meet. We w most of us were meeting once a year, um, but it is quite hard to to uh, get together with people. Yes, yes.
restriction on the diameter? Uh, just in the like, you know, physically move the thing around Australia, or is there some other part of it? Uh, yeah, so the diameter of the hab is based on bridges, mm -hmm. bridge height, and um, uh, you, uh, you are uh, required to have a police car escorting you if you're over 4.5 metres and we're at 4.7, so we, we, that will cost us extra if we mm. want to move it around, yeah. Okay. Um, but, but, but it wasn't to that level, but it's not like a margin you could go larger. Um, you can go larger. I think five metres is, uh, is a good number to aim for.